our beloved colleague, Rodney De La Santa, who passed away four years ago. And I realize you are the first group of students who have had no acquaintance with Rodney De La Santa whatsoever. Um, and that's sad, but in many ways it's not true because Rodney had such a profound effect on the faculty at Providence College that, believe me, you have been influenced indirectly, but yes, you have. So let me introduce uh, Father Shanley, who will speak a bit about Rodney De La Santa. Welcome, Father Shanley. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. On the tree outside that's dedicated to Dr. De La Santa is the last line from the prologue, the description of the clerk. And most of you know the lines by heart because they typified the way Rodney taught, gladly would he learn and gladly teach. But there are a few lines before that in the prologue that struck me as apropos of Rodney as well. We tend to fix on that last line because it so aptly characterized him. But I just want to read you a few lines that precede, gladly would he learn and gladly teach. Of study took he utmost care and heed. Not one word spoke he more than was his need. Although Rodney did speak more than one word. <laughs> and that was said in fullest reverence, in short and quick and full of high good sense. Pregnant of moral virtue was his speech, and gladly would he learn and gladly teach. Rodney did take the utmost care and heed for study. He was a scholar's scholar. And I know we had on display his annotated issue of the Canterbury Tales, or edition of the Canterbury Tales. We could see the copious notes in the side. He loved words, and he revered words, and used them well. Not always short and quick. Full of good high sense, yes. The line that struck me the most, so pregnant, pregnant of moral virtue, was his speech. Rodney was a good man. He wasn't just... Uh, a brilliant academic, he was an extraordinarily good human being, and I think the students caught that from him. And we gather today to remember him, and it is, I was thinking the same thing as Dr. Lynch, it's a little bit sad for me to think that most of you students don't even know Dr. De La Santa, but Dr. Lynch is right, you do, because everybody who teaches that touched him has somehow been influenced by him, I know I was as a student. And in a day devoted to words, and the beauty of words, and the wonder of words, we give him his due by talking about the Oxford English Dictionary. He would love to have been here. So it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this occasion. Uh, I ask you to say a prayer for Rodney and his family. I'm sure this is a tough time of the year for them. Uh, April does make me think of Rodney, not just for the Canterbury Tales, but this was the time of the year. I remember going to visit him Holy Week, right before he died. So. Uh, this is the time of the year for our thoughts and our prayers and our gratitude for Rodney. Thank you. Thank you, Father Shanley. This lecture series is sponsored by alumni of the Honors Program, and I think it's only appropriate that we have an alum from the program do the introduction. So I'd like to introduce our introducer, uh, Roy Peter Clark, he is the Dean of the Faculty and a Senior Scholar at the Pointer Institute down in Florida. Uh, he has also uh, edited or written 15 books, so I could go on at great length, but I will not. All right. Uh, Roy, welcome. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I flew up this morning from Florida to be here um, on the sort of most turbulent um, flight of um, my traveling life. But um, uh, I prayed to St. Christopher, and um, then I remembered that I was flying Southwest Airlines on a 737. And uh, so then I went past St. Christopher right to the big guy. <laughs> Greetings, brothers and sisters of the word. I graduated from PC in uh, 1970, which happened to be Brian Barber's first year teaching at the school, so that should tell you something about how old I am. I am a, the product of a great liberal arts education here, a student 
who studied with the likes of Rennie Fortin and Paul Thompson, John Cunningham, and of course, Rodney DeLaSanta. I loved Rodney as a friend and mentor. And the last time I was here to address um, the liberal arts students, um, in front of that group, I sang Italian songs while Rodney played the accordion. Um, <laughs> So it was not just high sentence, but occasionally low sentence that uh, motivated us. After I began my teaching career as a medievalist, Rodney used to refer to me as the student who sat in that chair. Now, I believe that he did that for lots of students and not just me. But he told me that he would point to a chair in a class and tell his class, that the student who wrote this about the Miller's Tale or that about the Summoner's Tale sat in that chair right there, a source of pride and inspiration. Officially, as our speaker knows, um, my dissertation from Stony Brook University is titled Chaucer and Medieval Scatology. <laughs> but it has come to be known by a more notorious title, Farting in the Middle Ages. <laughs> and I, I have never forgiven Rodney for that. <laughs> Rodney would have loved Amon Shea. That's how you pronounce his name. Think of ham and eggs. Backgammon, that's that A. Amon Shea. A man who swims inside the English language. I um, had this memory, which I want to just read a paragraph or two about. And it's about my own earliest experience of lexicography and its power. So I wrote, when I was just a little writer, skinny, myopic, prepubescent, growing up in a New York City suburb, I began to feel the first tremors of emerging manhood, and I felt them most powerfully in the presence of a local teenage girl whose nickname was Angel Face. She even wore a brown leather jacket with that name painted on the back. <laughs> Along with the leather jacket, she wore pedal pushers, those ultra-tight forerunners of capri pants. Each day, Angel Face would strut down the hill past my house, and I would spot her like a bird watcher through the picture window. <laughs> One day, this reverie vanished with the sudden appearance of my mother, who snuck up behind me and pierced the bubble of my fantasy with this crack. Ha! Huh, there goes old Angel Face. <laughs> You mean angel face, I snap. Take another look, buddy boy. That stupid little juvenile delinquent misspelled her name on her jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was. Angel face, A-N-G-E-L, was really angle face, A-N-G-L-E, and I could never look at her the same way again. <laughs> Someone says, well, if she'd only had spell check. <laughs> Not long ago, I, um, I was trying to, I was, uh, I'd used the, uh, the word paraclete uh, in an essay. Can't remember the context. And the red light went under paraclete. And I said, no, I, th I think that's the way you spell it. I haven't used it in a while. And I, I clicked on it, and it wanted me to change it to parakeet, uh, <laughs> which is, um, I think sort of a, uh, would have been a significant demotion in the world of, uh, of birds. When Amon Shea was, when Amon Shea was just a lad, his eighth grade teacher conducted a class on homonyms, writing words like A-L-T-E-R, alter, and seeing if the class could come up with A-L-T-A-R. One day, the teacher wrote the word H-O-A-R-D, hoard on the board, and the class responded with horde, H-O-R-D-E. Mr. Wozniak, the teacher, was about to move along 
when young Ammon raised his hand and indicated that there was yet another homonym that Mr. Wozniak had neglected to include. <laughs> he spelled it out for the class, W-H-O-R-E-D, and then even used it in a sentence. <laughs> the squire whored his way across all of London. I encountered that anecdote in Ammon's wonderful book, Reading the OED, One Man, One Year, 21,730 pages. That story was all I needed to know about the young word master, but I've learned more that his parents limited television watching in the house to such an extent that he would one day turn out to be someone who read dictionaries for fun. <laughs> that he, has, he had financed his quest to possess dictionaries, he owns more than a thousand, with jobs that included being a gondolier, a furniture mover in New York City, where he makes his home, and as a street musician in Paris playing the jazz saxophone. He writes columns and reviews for the uh, New York Times, I'm happy to say, and ad in addition to his book on the OED, Ammon has co-authored two previous books on depraved and insulting words, and most recently has turned his interest to perhaps the most useful of American non-narrative texts. His book is called The Phone Book, the curious history of the book that everyone uses, but no one reads. Ladies and gentlemen, though I stand here a bit impluvious from the day's weather, it is my pleasure to introduce to you this afternoon a nod crafty vocabularian without peer, Amin Shea. Hello. Uh, can everybody hear me okay like this? Okay, great. Well, well thank you for, uh, for that fine introduction. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm really both delighted and uh, honored to be here speaking today. Um, Mr. Wozniak never really forgave me for that, um, <laughs> that third synonym. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it, it, it did foreshadow a life in, uh, in dictionaries. Um, when, when people find out that I I took off a year of my life to really do nothing but read the Oxford English Dictionary in its entirety. Um, they usually follow a, a fairly uh, predictable series of questions immediately after, the first of which almost invariably is, uh, are you mad? Um, some more or less polite variation on that. Um, the next question is generally, uh, what will you read next? And this is in turn typically followed by a very unhelpful litany of suggestions of what I could read next. And, uh, people offer up all kinds of other non-narrative texts, such as the telephone book, um, things I could uh, go on to read. Um, and this, this saddens me a little bit, and it's, it's not at all because I really mind people thinking that I'm mad. I'm really entirely comfortable with that. Um, it saddens me because I think it's, um, it's really a shame that, that, that people view reading dictionaries as such a, an, an, an inherent bore. Um, it's like they think, of a, it, it's like they think of it as a bookish form of pika. And pika, for those of you who aren't intimately familiar with it, is um, it's a, an affliction that uh, some people suffer from, particularly pregnant women, in which they eat non-food things, such as sawdust or chalk. And uh, it's as, as though people think that reading dictionaries is kind of the intellectual form of ingesting sawdust. Um, personally, I think that the dictionary is a great read. And uh, I, I don't just mean this in the sense that it's a pleasant book to dip into now and then, though that's true as well. I mean it in the sense that this particular reference book has, um, I think it has all the, the qualities of any great work of literature one that can be read straight through with the notable exception of plot. Um, I, I think that, <laughs> this is maybe important to some people. You know? I, I think that the dictionary is, has humor, it has sadness, it has pathos, joy, um, melancholy, everything you could possibly want in a, in a great book. Um, in a sense, it's kind of the, the, the cataloging and the, the story of the English language. Um, and as such, I think it's also, it's really the, the human condition, kind of writ alphabetic. And uh, I, I understand that these, these claims, uh, I, I like to make that the dictionary has got this emotional content, um, they tend to elicit a certain amount of skepticism. Um, and so I, I like to provide some examples of 
individual words that are not often used that you find in particularly the OED, that are the words that kind of brought about this reaction in me. Um, the, the Oxford English Dictionary defines reward as a verb, as um, to recall with remorse or sadness. And, um, I think when you see that word on the page and you see that definition, it's impossible if you dwell on it to not call to mind something in your own life that you recall with, uh, with some kind of regret or sadness. Um, similarly, the, uh, the word desiderium is defined as something that is once owned and now lost and which you feel sadness for no longer having. Um, I, I think you have to think about something that you once owned and no longer have. And I really hope it's, you're not thinking about your car keys when you think about that. I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing that should draw to mind um, something poignant, I hope. You know, lost innocence, past loves, and kind of ineffable confusion, delight of youth. Um, but in this, uh, in this vein, most evocative of all, I think, is the word flingy. Um, and flingy means pretty much exactly what you would hope it would mean, which is the person at whom something is flung. Um, and uh, if you can think about flingy without immediately calling to mind someone at whom you would like to fling a wrench or something, you're, you're a far better person than I am because uh, it always comes to mind for me. Um, you know, if, if we allow ourselves you know, the pleasure of seeing these words in this new light and a new use, and this is, I think, what the, uh, the, the literary giants of the pharmaceutical industry call aftermarket use, um, then uh, I think that we're, we're allowing ourselves um, a kind of far greater impact to be made on us from this, this marvelous beast that is the, uh, the English language. Um, when I discovered the word petrichor, which is defined as the smell of rain when it comes wafting off the ground, when a rain first begins to fall, um, you know, I realized that this is not a word that I'm going to be using in conversation. It's not a particularly useful word, at least I, I hope never to use it in conversation. Um, uh, but it's a delightful word nonetheless, because every time that it rains now, I pay more attention to this, uh, this particular phenomenon, and, uh, and so I notice it more. Um, I don't need to use it with anybody else. Um, there's, there's also a, a word that only exists in the, the OED and then a small dictionary from 1623 which uh, describes the warmth of the sun in wintertime and the word is uh, apricity. And again, I'm never going to use the word apricity in conversation, but I now, knowing that there's a word for this, um, I pay much more attention to uh, the warmth of the sun in wintertime and so it, uh, it makes my life far richer for knowing it. Um, I, I will admit that there are a number of words that I think are interesting that I found that I, I, I didn't see the utility for at the time. Um, when, I, when I first came across uh, the word unbe pissed in the Oxford English Dictionary, which oddly enough means exactly what it looks like, which is uh, the state of not yet having been urinated upon. Um, <laughs> true word. Um, I, I, I was rather skeptical of it. There should, at one point in time in the history of the English-speaking people, there should have been so many things which were urinated on that it necessitated the need, you know, there was a need to distinguish between that which had and hadn't. Um, needless to say, this is before I became a father. Um, <laughs> and uh, as the extremely proud and occasionally damp father of an 18-month-old boy, uh, I can now safely say that there are two chronological uh, segments in my life. There was the be pissed and the unbe pissed. Um, <laughs> um, you know, and w when you hear that there's a word that defines a, a person who has the confidence of ignorance, um, which is Bayard, um, I think it's inevitable that you're going to draw to mind immediately some political figure or other. Um, or knowing that there's a word for somebody who spits when they speak, um, which is sialoquent, um, I think it's inevitable that you will then think of some unfortunate person that you know that matches this word. Uh, unfortunately, knowing that these words exist does not make these particular people any easier to, to deal with. But um, th there's some small comfort to be found in their knowledge anyway. Um, I think occasionally there is humor found in the dictionary, even if it is uh, generally unintentionally put in there. Um, the, the Oxford English Dictionary defines the word jive ass as a person who loves fun or excitement. Um, I, 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 I thought maybe they, 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 they mislabeled this one just a, a, a tad. Um, if you look at all the citations for jive ass in the Oxford English Dictionary, they, they all tend to come from mid-20th century African-American writers, and none of them seem to be uh, describing a person who loves fun or excitement. Um, 
I, I would like to point out that um, he, most of the time when I, when I thought I had found a mistake in, the, in reading the OED, it was a very exciting thing when you think you found a mistake in, this, in the greatest dictionary in the world. Most of the time when I thought I found a mistake, it turned out that it was really me that was a uh, mistake. They defined the word murinoid as resembling the mouse or its allies, um, which is a very strange definition. When I first found it, I, I was positive I, I, I had actually come across a, a great example of what it must have been bring your beer to work day at Oxford. <laughs> um, and that they had confused the writing of the dictionary with uh, a synopsis of Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then, as it turns out, uh, ally is actually just a slightly obscure taxonomic term and uh, exists all throughout the dictionary. The alkaline metals have allies and apparently so do the ferns. Um, so it really wasn't um, a mistake in any way. Um, you know, some people might really question why, uh, if there's any use to know these words. Um, and uh, I, I don't have any, any good defense of it. Um, there's no use to knowing that the word for a repaired crack is prend, or that the word for uh, a mistake made out of ignorance is uh, ignatism. Uh, I don't think you can possibly make the case that um, knowing that there is a word which means suggestive of pigeons will improve your life. Um, it's peristeronic, um, which should not be confused with anatiferous, which means producing geese. Um, these words will not get you the corner office in life, I am here to tell you. Um, but um, I think that there is another uh, use for these, and it doesn't have anything to do with communication. Um, personally, I find that the, the, the greatest pleasure in these words are those that exist seemingly for no other reason than for uh, individual enjoyment. Um, I think they're tiny little works of art that kind of float in my own head, non-corporeally. Um, and I think we don't tend to question the use of other forms of art or music. Nobody questions the need for uh, Beethoven symphonies or Shostakovich's string quartets. There's uh, no reason why we should question why we need to know these words. And uh, by way of explanation, I would like to introduce another word uh, which isn't have, doesn't have that much currency today, which is holophrasis. And uh, holophrasis is a term that um, particularly means uh, it comes up most often in linguistics, uh, especially early childhood language acquisition. And holophrasis is the habit of using a single word to express an entire concept, such as when the child uh, says down, meaning I would like to stop eating and get down from this chair, or go, meaning uh, let's put aside childish things and get to the playground. Um, I don't see why we can't take this childish concept and kind of broaden it. Um, I think it's uh, really a shame that we can't look at single words and think that they, uh, they can communicate entire broad, dense, kind of emotionally laden concepts. Um, and I, I understand that what I'm advocating in terms of this, reading the dictionary for this kind of enjoyment, is not really the purpose for which the dictionary was intended. Um, in a sense, it's kind of a misuse of the dictionary. And uh, it's a benign misuse of the dictionary, but it is a misuse of it. Um, and I'd like to kind of uh, change subjects slightly and then talk about other misuses of the dictionary. Because subsequent to reading the Oxford English Dictionary, I made the uh, rather predictable career shift of going to work for Oxford University Press um, as a consulting editor under American Dictionaries. Um, and so I'd like to talk about a subject that's uh, of great interest and frustration to the people who make dictionaries, which is the, the kind of some of the myths and misconceptions that come up about dictionaries. And uh, to start with, uh, Samuel Johnson did not write the first English dictionary, though. He is widely credited with doing so. Um, the English dictionary, as we know it, starts in 1604 with the publication of a tiny little book called A Table Alphabetical, written by a main, man named Robert Caudry. Um, and these early dictionaries, this earliest one, they're nothing like the dictionaries that we know today. It was about 250 pages long, defined two and a half thousand words. Um, and this dictionary and all the other ones that were to follow for the next hundred years were entirely concerned with defining what was referred to at the time as hard words or inkhorns. And so they were full of words like victimate, which means to offer in sacrifice. 
uh, anti-Pelargy, which is the uh, supposed reciprocal love that children have for their parents, and um, irre irremunerable, which means not to be rewarded. Um, dictionaries didn't really be begin to define common words until the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, even when they did, when they tried to catalog the entirety of the, uh, the English language, they did so in a way that was really kind of lackadaisical at best. Um, one of the earliest people who did this was a man named Nathan Bailey, and uh, this is evidenced by the fact that when he defined cow, he referred to it as a beast well known. Um, <laughs> this was scarcely an improvement over the definition that he had essentially cribbed from one of his predecessors, John Kersey, who defined it as a well known beast. Um, <laughs> So really, when they, when they did get around to defining the common words, they were essentially saying, come on, everybody knows what a cow is. You know, I, I don't think I need to tell you that. Um, but by the time that Johnson published his first great dictionary, which is the, came out in 1755, uh, the theory and the practice of lexicography were pretty much established. Johnson didn't do anything uh, entirely new in his dictionary. He had predecessors in terms of etymologies, adding pronunciations, citations usage notes and everything. Uh, Samuel Johnson did have one thing uh, with his dictionary that really set it apart from all the ones that came before it. <clears throat> he wrote the, the first truly great English dictionary. Um, he did nothing new, but he did everything better. Um, it had a, a truly profound effect on lexicography for decades to come, and it had a profound effect on the English language, and probably did more than any other uh, book to kind of codify our wayward spelling at the time. <clears throat> One of the other popular myths in the, the history of dictionaries was that the, the first American dictionary was written by Noah Webster. Um, it was not. It was uh, actually written by Samuel Johnson, although it's a completely unrelated Samuel Johnson's, the one we were just talking about. <clears throat> but there were about a, a half dozen dictionaries that were written by Americans before Webster published his first one in 1806. So, you know, it's kind of curious that we, we always hear that Webster wrote the first American dictionary, and I, I think the reason we hear it more often than not is because uh, he wrote the first great American dictionary, um, and he also wrote the, uh, the first dictionary that treated the American uh, usage as its own distinct variant. Uh, he was the first one who didn't just simply kind of parrot um, what was being written in England at the time. And uh, one of the results of this is that the name Webster has become synonymous with dictionary in, uh, in North America. And so everybody that publishes the dictionary in America publishes some variant of their dictionary with the word Webster in it. Um, so you, you can buy dictionaries that are such as Random House's Webster or you know, uh, the New World Webster Dictionary. My, my, my personal favorite of this is a, a dictionary from the 1930s I have that used to be apparently given out for free at gas stations, and it's the, the standard oil dictionary, uh, Webster's Dictionary. So even, even standard oil got in on the act and had their own, <coughs> their own Webster. Um, but uh, there really is only one kind of real Webster's Dictionary, which is the one published by George and Charles Merriam, Merriam Webster. Uh, these are some of the kind of historical misconceptions of the dictionary. Um, but there, there are some others that I think are really commonly held by a lot of people. And one is that there's this notion that if a word is not in the dictionary, that it doesn't exist somehow. It's not really a word. Um, and people who write dictionaries tend to leave words out of them all the time. Um, there's no way you can ever put all the words in a language or in a living language into a dictionary. Um, and a, a, a great example of this was in a, when the Oxford English Dictionary was being read in the first edition, um, James Murray, the editor, was deliberating whether or not he should put the word appendicitis in the dictionary. And he wrote to a number of prominent surgeons who all said, don't worry about it. Nobody's ever going to ask you about appendicitis. It's a totally obscure word. You're safe. Just skip it. Leave it out. And so they left it out. And of course, a few years later, uh, I think King Henry VIII had his coronation delayed by two weeks when he came down with a nasty case of appendicitis. Every newspaper in the world was writing about this. And uh, Oxford was flooded with angry letters asking why uh, appendicitis wasn't in the dictionary. Um, this kind of thing is really kind of impossible to, uh, to, to, to plan for. Uh, the other thing that uh, for most of the 20th century was left out of dictionaries were uh, offensive and taboo words. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary was not alone in this. They left out most of these words. And then in 1972, when they started um, 
printing a, what was the, uh, the supplement to the original Oxford English Dictionary, the decision was made to add them. And now uh, I'm very proud to say that Oxford has probably not just the most scholarly, but also the filthiest dictionary um, in the English language. Um, in general, for what goes into a dictionary, um, lexicographers tend to make their decisions based on usage. And in a way, you can say they decide uh, what goes in their book based on what word is popular. Uh, I'm confirming many people's fears here, I think, about the, the decline of the English language. Um, they make decisions based on what's popular, however, with uh, some very kind of strict uh, parameters set, which is that if a word is used by enough people and enough circumstances and in enough kinds of publications for long enough, uh, it will end up in the dictionary. Um, lexicographers tend to not be concerned with whether a word is real or how it's formed. Um, and this has led over the last half century to a, a lot of complaints from people who think that uh, dictionaries are kind of giving up the mantle of linguistic authority. Um, which is a little strange because lexicographers by and large have never asked for this particular uh, mantle. And a, a well-known case came in 1961 when uh, Merriam-Webster published the third new international Webster's Dictionary. It was a kind of revolutionary and a, a wonderful dictionary. And uh, at first, it was a, an enormous flop. People hated it. It was uh, widely condemned. And um, in large part, it was because they did things uh, like they put the word ain't in the dictionary. And uh, they said that ain't was, although uh, unpopular and mainly used by uneducated speakers, was in fact used by a majority of educated speakers in the country. Uh, almost universal condemnation arose from this. People were outraged that a dictionary would say that people actually used the word ain't. Um, and unfortunately, uh, most people do in fact use the word ain't, which is why it went in the dictionary. Um, this didn't stop the New York Times from throwing a massive hissy fit and writing an editorial in which they said, we were refused to use Webster's third. We're going to continue using Webster's second dictionary. Um, there were uh, a number of books written about this controversy, editorials right, left, and center. There was another company that was formed with the actual purpose of buying up Merriam-Webster so that they could recall the third dictionary <laughs> pulpit and then immediately go to work on the fourth. Uh, this effort failed, and the people who tried it then went on to form their own dictionary in a kind of snip, and that was the, uh, the American Heritage Dictionary, which is today another fine dictionary. Um, but, you know, everybody here is a, an educated or a cultured speaker of the English language, and I'm willing to bet the, uh, the, the overwhelming majority of use the word ain't in some context throughout your life, so it is really often used. Um, eventually, people got over this kind of strange fascination with hating Webster's third, and now it's looked at as a kind of a, a classic dictionary. Um, another myth, though, is that you can get a word into the dictionary if it's an interesting enough word, um, if it's a really great word that should exist. And um, every dictionary publisher or dictionary writer I know routinely gets enormous quantities of mail saying, you know, this word should be in the dictionary. And it's most of the time, not an actual word. It's just somebody comes up and there should be a word for this. It's a kind of variation on there ought to be um, something. Um, and unfortunately, um, that's not how words get into the dictionary, no matter how often we come across a word that we make up and think would be actually delightful. Um, if you do, however, uh, have evidence of a, a real word that's not in the dictionary, um, generally they're more than happy to hear from you. Um, in fact, crowdsourcing, uh, existed well before uh, Wikipedia. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary is oftentimes referred to as the, one of the, the earliest forms of uh, instances of a, a crowdsourced intellectual work. Um, an enormous amount of this dictionary was written by people who weren't actually working on it. They were written by volunteers. Um, there were thousands of volunteers across the UK and across North America who would write in providing a a, a large portion of the two and a half million literary citations that went into this work. Um, and one of the, the best known people who did this was a man named William Minor, who sent in tens of thousands of uh, citations and literary illustrations, uh, all the while uh, being locked in the Broadmoor Insane Asylum, um, uh, Broadmoor Asylum for the Criminally Insane, where he was locked because he 
killed somebody and because he was completely insane. Um, but he was a, a major contributor to the Oxford English Dictionary. It's a story that's really kind of beautifully toned by, told by uh, Simon Winchester, a book professor in The Madman. Um, and although a large amount of the Oxford English Dictionary was crowdsourced, um, it, it was provided by educated people, um, or people who are interested in the language. Um, and this is a, it was an enormous kind of part of the character of the dictionary was formed by these volunteers. Um, and it's uh, kind of striking when you look at it compared to uh, what is one of the more prominent crowdsourced intellectual endeavors today, which is urbandictionary.com. Um, I don't know if any of you have the particular misfortune of looking at this, but it's a, it's a, a stunning compilation of the kind of venality of public discourse and an, an enormous condemnation on the state of our current intellectual and educational system, I think. Uh, I can think of nothing nice to say about this particular dictionary, which is strange because I love all dictionaries, <laughs> um, except for this one. Um, if you ever want to see a, a great example of what can go wrong when you have no intellectual safeguards in a kind of publicly done project like this, go spend some time looking at uh, urbandictionary.com and um, you'll come away very saddened, I think. Um, on the other hand, I'm a huge fan of Wikipedia. I think Wikipedia is great. Um, I think it's a wonderful resource. I think it's a wonderful site. I think it's done beautifully. And oddly enough, uh, in doing fact-checking on a number of uh, dictionaries and encyclopedias, uh, most of the areas I've looked at, um, it's far more accurate uh, than, uh, than people give it credit for. Um, in particular, looking at things like political figures, it's much more accurate than the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, and it's 10 times as much information. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I have mixed feelings on the, the kind of introduction of reference material into the internet. Um, I think there are some ways in which it's uh, not so great, but there are other ways in which it's really uh, given us these phenomenal strides forward. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that people seem to not realize about the, uh, the OED is that uh, most, well, most people access it online now. And there, there are huge differences between reading the OED online and reading it in print. Um, it's currently being revised. They started editing it again in 2000, and they've managed to edit all the letters between M and R so far, so they're moving at their normal accelerated pace, <clears throat> meaning they'll finish it another 30 or 40 years. Um, and they're adding these additions and changes online. And there, there, there have been no uh, decisions made as to whether or not they will once again print this when they finish revising it. Uh, the estimates I've heard from people working on it are that it would probably be about twice as long, meaning it'll be 40,000 pages if they do print it. Um, but one of the things that they do that very few other people do with online dictionaries is they really kind of change the way that you can search it. And if you're at all interested in the English language and you're all at all interested in dictionaries, and I assume because I don't see anybody asleep yet, that you must have some glimmer of interest in this, all of you. <clears throat> um, I can't recommend strongly enough going and looking at the, uh, the OED online. Um, the way most dictionaries work is that you just look up the word alphabetically that you're interested in finding. Um, However, there's no way this solves the problem of how do you look up a word that you don't know. Um, well, you could read the whole dictionary, but very few people are sick enough to do that. <clears throat> um, you can search the Oxford English Dictionary any possible way. You can look for any word that exists anywhere in the, the entire text. You can find a word that exists anywhere only in etymologies or only in definitions. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to find that word petrichor, meaning having the smell of rain, you could just look up all the definitions that have the word rain. It will give you maybe 150 words, and then you know every word in the English language cataloged by the OED that deals with rain. Um, it's it's kind of a way of looking at the dictionary from the inside out. That, and I don't understand why other dictionaries never do this. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a real shame that we, we so little take advantage of the possibilities of the internet as, as, as applies to reference work. Um, it's as so though really all that people are doing is they're, they're taking uh, the internet and they're using it to put a very large book in a very small space, which is nifty if you can fit the OED in your pocket, but it's not really any more useful than having the book. Um, so that's something that I like to say about the, uh, the OED that I think is often overlooked and really should be uh, paid more attention to. Um, Though, getting back to linguistic pet peeves that people may or may not have, um, you know, wh one of the language-related questions that I, I hear most frequently is this kind of plaintive inquiry about, you know, what can we do to save our language, you know, to stop these scurrilous words from, you know, these illegitimate terms from creeping into English. 
Um, my response is always more or less the same, which is that you're an excellent company because a number of very smart people have been asking the same kind of peevish question for hundreds of years, and the chances of stopping the way that the language changes are pretty much the same as theirs, which is to say you have no chance at all. Um, people have been complaining about this for uh, pretty much ever since English started. Um, in 1644, there was a, a small pamphlet that had the large name of uh, Vindex Anglicus, and it was a the perfections of the English language defended and attested. And it was basically just one guy's pet peeve about the silly words that were creeping into this language, and he managed to get it published. Um, and most of the words that he was complaining about were what are, were referred to as inkhorn terms, which are these kind of absurd Latinate constructions that were popular in the 17th century that people were trying to create. It was a kind of one-upsmanship of who can make the fanciest variation on English by importing Latin and Greek terms. Um, so a lot of these words were uh, words like catalate, which means to lick dishes, or bulbitate, which the uh, Oxford English Dictionary kind of uh, delicately defines as to be filth one's breeches, um, <laughs> and, and not too hard to figure out. Um, so you know you you can see where this guy was coming from away. But some of the other words that he was uh, really arguing against were words like contrast and mephitic. Um, neither of which, well, mephitic is a little unusual, but it's not really outside the, the realm of possibility that people would use that word in daily conversation. In contrast, now is uh, entirely normal. Um, so it's, it's really difficult to figure out in advance what words are going to stick and what words will not. Um, I think, though, that the, the thing that, um, that depresses lexicographers more than anything else is when you tell them that something is not a real word. Um, and this is uh, something that, that, that I hear quite often. If I say something that's obviously nonsense, like gilavagi or whatever, I just make something up, um, it clearly doesn't mean anything. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to communicate anything. Um, and it, it is, in fact, not a real word. Um, but this is not usually what people mean when they say that's not a real word. Usually they're talking about something like irregardless or LOL or OMG or something like that. Um, and what, what they actually mean is, I think, is that this is a word that I don't like more than this is not a real word. Um, and, you know, one of the areas in which this comes up, I think, more than anything else is, um, is politics. It's a really fertile area for making fun of people's language or disagreeing with people's language. Um, I think this has a lot more to say about politics than it has to say about language. Um, and the following examples I'm going to give and defend, I have to say in advance, are in no way indicative of my own political leanings, but um, I think they're, they're kind of irresistible to, to, to defend. Um, George W. Bush was really widely disparaged for his use of the word um, misunderestimate. Um, <laughs> he fairly famously claimed they misunderestimated me. Um, and I, I'm willing to bet as well that a number of people in this room have laughed about George W. Bush at some point and his use of that particular word. Um, However, Bush was not the first person to use this word. Um, misunderestimate was used as far back as 1897 um, and used many times in the ensuing 100 years. Uh, the earliest use of it I saw was in a, a fairly well-respected political magazine um, in the 19th century, which was called New Outlook. And it was in a piece on American diplomacy in the Bosphorus. It was written by some PhD in history, and nobody seems to have been that upset about it. Um, John Conyers, Jr., was a well-known uh, Democratic congressman, uh, used misunderestimate. I think he was testifying in front of a, a Senate subcommittee, and there's transcripts of it, and it was reported in the news, but nobody said John Conyers, Jr. is obviously an idiot. Um, and I think what happens, it's, it's, it's tempting to say, well, this is such a barbarous, such a ludicrous word that it must obviously reflect on this person's intelligence, but if you listen to everything that somebody says and somebody speaks quite often, I think it's inevitable that um, they will misuse words. Um, and again, I, I, I'm not offering this as a defense of George W. Bush in, in any way, shape, or form, um, but I, I am defending his language use. Um, and misunderestimate, it's fairly obviously just, uh, it's, you know, what you call a catechesis, a misuse of a word, and he took the word, um, underestimate, and he added an unnecessary prefix, miss, in front of it, and uh, thus was born a thousand chortles and 
you know, guffaws among, uh, among the people of America. Uh, however, it's not uncommon for other words to enter the language this way. The word ammunition is nothing more than a corruption of the word munition with an unnecessary prefix added in front of it. Um, we don't feel at all ashamed when we use the word ammunition, but it was really formed exactly the same way as misunderestimate was. Um, Sarah Palin was, again, widely mocked for uh, refudiate which was a, a blend of refute and repudiate. And again, I, I have no particular interest in defending Sarah Palin or her um, intelligence, but uh, her language use is another thing. Um, and uh, refudiate exists in English writing or American writing since 1895. It's been used dozens of times over the last hundred years. Um, she was not the first person to use it. Uh, and she was certainly not the first person to introduce a portmanteau word, <coughs> meaning a blend of two other words. Lewis Carroll did it all the time, albeit in a slightly more literary fashion. Um, I think with someone like Sarah Palin, part of the problem is that, um, that it was not the actual action, it was the defense subsequent where she compared herself to Shakespeare <laughs> that um, kind of got her in some, some hot water. Um, I, I think, though, that the most unfair example of somebody being excoriated for a mistake with a word, it's a little bit different, but um, it deals with spelling, but I'd like to bring it up nonetheless. Um, and one, one of our former vice presidents, who I'm sure you all know already, Dan Quayle, was really famously branded an idiot. Um, not solely, but not least because he had the singular misfortune of incorrectly correcting, I think it was a fifth grader, uh, in a spelling bee and in which he told the student that the correct spelling of potato has an E at the end of it. Um, now, as we all know, there is no E at the end of potato. But why do we all know that there is no E there? Um, because until pretty recently, spelling potato with an E at the end was not terribly uncommon. Um, it wasn't common, per se. It wasn't like they had equal weight. But potato with an E exists all throughout the 20th century in respected publications. Um, potato was spelled with an E in the Washington Post uh, in November 22nd of 1990. The newspaper, The Oregonian, spelled it that way in May of that year. The New York Times used it repeatedly in 1988, 1989. Um, in no cases were this, uh, corrections issued immediately after. And what's funny is that if you look through a, a database like LexisNexis, you see that potato was spelled with an E for all of the 20th century until, bang, June 15th, 1992, suddenly nobody spells potato with an E anymore, <laughs> which is the date that Dan Quayle famously blundered. Um, and so I, I, I think that rather than make fun of Quayle for this, we really should be kind of commending our former vice president because uh, he single-handedly set the spelling of potato in our national consciousness. Um, and whether intentionally or not, I think he has thereby had far more effect on spelling reform than any of us can hope to ever have. Um, you know, it's also, it's really not unheard of or unusual for words to come into our language by mistake or for mistaken forms of words to become the more commonly used variant. Uh, Coco, which none of us thinks twice about pronouncing, was a, a mistaken form of the Spanish cacao. Uh, my personal favorite is the word injury, which was, uh, an, it was a, a word for the uh, kind of lemur, uh, a babacute, uh, a Madagascar lemur. And it came into our language when the, the French naturalist, uh, Sonorat, who was looking for this animal, was in the bush with his guides. And they saw this animal and they pointed at it and they said, injury, which in Malagasy means there it is. And he saw them saying injury and said, well, that must be an injury. And so he wrote it down in his book and that became the name for this animal, um, which is now named There It Is in Malagasy. Um, <laughs> so I, I think this kind of demonstrates that words are sometimes formed in somewhat awkward ways. Um, you know, and you know, words that you might disagree with uh, they may have labels attached to them in the dictionary, they may be substandard, they may be slang, they may be offensive, they may be colloquial, but they are definitely still words. Um, and if they're, uh, if they're used by a large portion of the population, um, the, the dictionary will do their best to take note of this fact. So, you know, one of the points that I really like to stress is that language inevitably changes. It has what I like to call a, an immutable mutability. Um, it's the nature of all living languages. And I think once we accept this premise that language changes, that we are kind of uh, 
abdicating our ability to dictate the way in which it changes. Um, I don't think we really have any more control over how language changes than we do have control over how any other life form changes. And uh, this is not to say that uh, I'm in favor of having no linguistic rules or that I, I, I'm not advocating a kind of lexicographic Vatican II, you know, where if it feels good, do it, um, or anything goes. Uh, I'm arguing that it's not the place of the dictionary to kind of pass judgment on whether language is or isn't correct. Um, but, you know, having given this kind of screed on what the dictionary is or isn't, um, I, I would like to return to a kind of earlier topic of something that the dictionary definitely isn't, which is that it's a, a book that we sit down and read. And um, I, I'd like to see this change in a way. Um, in, in the last couple of years, I've, I've come across people who read all kinds of really strange things, like telephone books and sales catalogs and strangest of all, train schedules. There's a, a small group of people who collect train schedules, particularly in the, in the UK. Apparently, Cooks is the, 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 the most desirable one. And the, the first time I came across somebody who was, told me he liked to read train schedules, I, I felt simultaneous relief and trepidation. And I, it was a relief that I met somebody whose reading habits were unquestionably odder than my own, and trepidation that I would be stuck sitting next to him at dinner. Um, <laughs> And then he explained to me why he read these, these pamphlets, and it really, it really changed my view of it uh, completely. He said that he wasn't just reading you know, train schedules. What he was doing is he was looking at uh, trips he had taken in the past to people who were no longer alive, and he was revisiting these trips. He was looking over places that he wanted to go and hoped to go one day. He was remembering old friends, old acquaintances, old loves. He was essentially creating an entire narrative structure just by looking at place names and times. And to me, this seemed to be such an incredibly rich imaginative exercise that I, I, really, I almost felt ashamed that I, I had this reliance on plot and character development. Um, you know, not entirely, but it did make it seem like this is a really kind of wonderful way of looking at this. If you can read a train schedule and be entertained, I think you'll never be bored in life. Um, though there are very few people who really do this. Um, but as a way of finishing, I, I'd like to bring up briefly a writer who's not often mentioned uh, these days, which I think is a great shame, if only because he came up with what I think is my, my all-time favorite definition when he referred to uh, cheese as milk's leap towards immortality. Um, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, he never worked for a dictionary, but I think he should have based on that. And that's uh, Clifton Fadiman. Uh, and Clifton Fadiman was not just a writer. He was also well known as a translator. Um, he was one of the, the, the first great television uh, hosts. He had a, a TV show called Conversation back when uh, we were all operating under this delusion that because TVs were expensive, wealthy, educated people would want to watch good shows. Um, and he was also one of the, the, the founding editors of the children's magazine Cricket. Um, he's, I think, a, a wonderful writer, though. And he, he has this, this essay in which he writes about how the most productive reading of his life occurred between the ages of 10 and 17. And this was because these were the, the years during which he didn't care what he was reading as long as he enjoyed it. Um, he wasn't reading things because he had to. He wasn't reading things because people told him he should. And he was reading just for the sheer uh, enjoyment of it. It was pure, unadulterated joy. Um, and when, when, when I read this, I, I, I thought that for me, too, these really were, the, I think, the best reading years of my life. Um, and coming along with this was a kind of attendant sadness that I've kind of gotten away from reading just because I enjoy it. And um, this is one of the things that led me to read dictionaries, uh, strange as that may seem. And what I, what I would really say in conclusion is I think that I, I feel that we should kind of revise our opinion on reading and kind of re-embrace that, that sense of wonderment that I hope we all had when we first discovered the, the true kind of misanthropic joy of losing ourselves in a book. Um, and I think that if, uh, if a dictionary or anything else, whether it's a phone book or a train schedule, has the ability to do what any great book does, if it can make us kind of miss our bus stop because we're immersed in what we're reading, if it can make us stay up late because we don't want to put down the book or get up early, um, if it can make us kind of simultaneously shut out the world while also feeling more part of humanity, um, then I think we have to consider any book that we're reading to be great. Um, uh, that's my...
talk on the dictionary. And what I would love to have now is any comments, questions, and in particular, argumentative statements about dictionary as a language that anybody would care to bring forward. Hi. My favorite word changes from time to time, so I, I, I have no all-time favorite word. Um, what is it? Puric? Great word. In response to your first question, though, um, I, 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 well, uh, it depends. I mean, the Oxford, Oxford, all dictionaries are different, first of all. They, they, all, they all have their own way of dealing with the, the language. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary is a historical dictionary, meaning they're looking at the entirety of English. So they'll write about words that meant something different than it means now. Um, for instance, uh, one of my favorites is envious. Uh, used to mean specifically unhappiness at the success of another person, kind of the opposite of schadenfreude. Um, and that's kind of changed, just being desirous of what somebody, somebody else has. Um, but I, I think that the role of the dictionary is to, if it's used enough to mean something by people, um, that it's supposed to reflect that, um, even if it's being used incorrectly, because if it's used incorrectly by enough people, the meaning will eventually shift. A um, great example of this is unique. Uh, many people who are in the profession of teaching are very unhappy about the way that the youth of today uses the word unique, uh, as in something is more unique or less unique or somewhat unique. This is viewed as the decline of Western civilization and, you know, uh, future and sociopathic behavior. Um, unfortunately, this was the, the most common use of the word unique throughout most of the 19th century. Uh, unique used to frequently mean more or less or something like that. Um, and so the OED will reflect that, that for this time period it meant this, and then for most of the 20th century, unique came to mean the sine qua non of, you know, the ultimate of something, the only thing. And now that is changing. Um, and I think that when they get to the use, they will probably uh, change the entry on unique to reflect this. Um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, one person's mistake is another person's linguistic shift. Uh, there, there are a few occasions in which dictionaries refuse to take notice of this. My personal favorite is the word enervate, um, which, as I'm sure we all know, means to deaden or to make something, you know, less active. And as the people outside this room, 50% of them think it means to energize. Uh, this has been 50-50 uh, since the 1920s, and there is, I think, not yet a single dictionary who is taking note of the fact that at least 50% of the Americans who use Enervate use it incorrectly in the same exact way. I think they should have noticed this by now, but the dictionaries, for one, whatever reason, are now holding their, their line on Enervate and refuse to accept that it's changing. So. Uh, no, etymology doesn't really play a role in whether a word changes or not. I mean, uh, you know, uh, if that's the case, then, you know, I mean, you know, ambisinistris means uh, having two left hands. It doesn't have anything to do with sinister. <coughs> uh, dexterity means right-handed if you go back uh, etym uh, and judge it by its etymology. Uh, so, uh, you know, etymology may give you the basis for a word, but the words you know, nine times out of ten are going to change so much they don't really have anything to do with, or they have only a limited, uh, you know, connection to it. Hi. Um, do you know of any instances where a regional term or a term that's used inappropriately regionally ever makes it into a dictionary as a possible definition? And of course, I'm thinking there are people around Boston who use the word wicked, <laughs> or, 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 or
Uh, and nowhere else in the known English speaking world or, or anyone ever associate those definitions with those words. Uh, absolutely, they will come in. Well, again, getting to the subject of various dictionaries, um, the Dictionary of American Regional English has not yet reached W, but when they do, they will most assuredly put wicked in in its uh, you know, New England sense. Um, dictionaries are now paying attention to this. For instance, um, the word, I was just talking to somebody at Oxford yesterday who said they're looking at the word special in the UK. And I think London in particular, special is now used by the youth of London to mean really not very special at all, in fact and kind of anti-special. Um, and so they're, they're making note of this, and if it sticks in a geographic reason, or if it starts to spread, um, it will go into the dictionary. Um, it, it's, it's a kind of fine line for most general purpose dictionaries, how much they should pay attention to, you know, what are distinct regionalisms. If a word starts to move outside of a region, or if it has, uh, if it's a large enough region, um, it will go in. Uh, I don't know if Wicked would necessarily make it into most, like, you know, I don't think Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary is going to take account of Wicked. Uh, but they're now working on the fourth uh, unabridged. That one might well take, into that, take that into account. So it's not unheard of. No. Yeah, hi. Um, I've got the Urban Dictionary in my iPhone. <laughs> and I'm looking up the word Dougie. And it says, definition swag, swagger, originated in Dallas, and it has a citation. She said she liked my Dougie. I'm fresh. My Dougie. And 2,000 people give that a thumbs up, and 600 a thumbs down. What's wrong with that, at least as a starting place to figure out where the hell Dougie came from? <laughs> At the risk of being flippant, I would say that I think 48 million people voted for Richard Nixon. So, um, uh, that, that is being flippant, I guess. Um, well, what, what's wrong with that is that, well, we don't know what, uh, if this person actually is telling the truth, for instance. Uh, we don't know, I mean, there are, uh, are there any other definitions for Dougie? Yeah, that's why I associated it with a dance. Uh -huh. Right. Um, my problem with Urban Dictionary is that when you look up something like that, uh, you get a word, say, Dougie or some other word, and that will be the first in what are maybe 15 different things, most of which are uh, frequently vulgar um, and oftentimes directed at some member of their immediate family, such as my brother Doug, who is such an effing idiot that I wish somebody would slam a car door in his head. Um, and I, I don't think that there's a real linguistic purpose being served because the things that are in fact genuine tend to get lost in the mix. Um, I think the number of things in there that are actually genuine efforts to catalog the language are, um, I don't know, 1 in 10, 1 in 15, and I can't tell the difference between the ones that are and the ones that aren't. Um, so I think that you're going to expend more effort trying to figure out whether something is real um, than it's worth. Um, I think that there are other ways of finding out something like this. Um, for instance, I think Google uh, can function as a kind of uh, great way for this. There's all these different ways that you can search Google. Um, and you can set up Google as your own personal search engine uh, not just as it exists now. You can give it 50 or 100 newspapers that you want it to look through. Um, you can give it 1,000 sites that you want it to look through. Um, and then you enter a term. And the best way of understanding the meaning of a word, and this is why the Oxford English Dictionary is 21,000 pages, is because they believe the best way of understanding the real meaning of a word is seeing it in context, seeing it used in a kind of organic sense. Um, I think that's true. I think you can do that on your own. It's a kind of do-it-yourself lexicography um, that many people now do with Google. They just Google a word and they see 50 examples of this word used. And that will really give you the true meaning and flavor of a word. Um, you know, it's a little harder if you're using something that's kind of common. Like if you look up the word set, you're never going to really figure it all out on your own. But, uh, you know, I, don't know I, 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 I realize I have an un kind of unreasoning bias against Urban Dictionary, but I'm, I'm holding on to it for now. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, you spoke about the searchability of the Oxford English Dictionary online. 
Um, actually, there's another dictionary that's on CD, uh, and it's Johnson's Dictionary, Cambridge University Press. Uh -huh. The Cambridge University Press published uh, a sort of searchable Samuel Johnson's Dictionary. You can search up word used in illustrative examples. Uh -huh. It's, it's a great question. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I don't know if it's possible to really answer. I mean, it still is a big book, but it's just a big book that exists online, I think. Um, Oxford also recently published a, a kind of classic example of a big book, which was the historical thesaurus of English. It was a team of madmen at University of uh, Edinburgh spent 45 years reading the OED. Uh, really making me look like a, an amateur. Um, essentially, they did a thesaurus of the OED by just sitting there, again, for 45 years, dozens of them looking up every word in the OED and saying, what word does that remind me of? And creating an, a 4,000-page thesaurus on this. Um, and so it exists now in two forms. One is in the book form, which is inordinately and prohibitively expensive. And then they also put it online, and it's now connected to the OED. Um, if I'm going to look something up in it, I look it up online. Um, if I want to read it, I read it in the book. Um, I think, though, that most people are going to skew increasingly uh, as time goes on toward the online. There have been a number of interesting studies done in the last five years or so that show that for most people, uh, reading comprehension is something like 25% better. Memory retention, retention of material is somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% better with a printed piece of paper. However, I, I haven't seen those studies in a couple of years, and I don't recall if, if they're allowing for age. I mean, the, the, one of the new terms coming to dictionaries now is digital native, which is more or less synonymous with millennials, which are people who were born recently enough that they've grown up with this. Um, they've grown up with laptops, they've grown up with tablets, and they've grown up reading on a computer, which I haven't. Um, I think that they will probably erase some of that discrepancy between reading on paper and reading, uh, uh, you know, like with memory retention based on reading paper or reading uh, on a computer screen. So I think that people are going to increasingly go towards that. Um, my, my impression is just, it's so much cheaper and for people who are working with it, it's so much easier to look something up in, a, in an online thing. The thing that I, that I find dispiriting is uh, kind of uh, faulty OCR work, um, optical character recognition, that comes up a lot. Um, that uh, Google Books scanned uh, hundreds of thousands, I mean millions and millions of books, and sometimes the, the optical character recognition is just done so poorly that this stuff exists in a database, but you c you're getting a mistaken idea. Um, so things that are going from print and are being scanned in, I think, are not so effective. Uh, things that are actually entered into the internet, you know, it, it's creating a document that is entirely internet-based, I think that they're really quite effective. Um, and if the Cambridge did that with Johnson, I think it's great. Um, it would be a, a wonderful resource. So. Hi. Uh, I'm yeah. curious your reaction in general to texting. Uh, uh, my, my reaction is, is, is much the same as the, the people. I haven't studied it, um, but I, I I, I did have written about it somewhat. 
Um, is really not that much new there. Um, David Crystal is a phenomenal linguist and writer on language, wrote a, a book on this called The Great Debate, and of course he spelled it G-R-8-D-B-8, um, in which he found that the majority of texting shorthand um, is from about 1945, 1935. It's not terribly new. There are some words, LOL is pretty new. Um, but we've been doing shorthand for ages. Um, there's nothing new about most of these terms. A great example is uh, last month the OED added the recent crop of additions to the dictionary, and OMG was one of them. Um, and before people got terribly upset about it, they took pains to point out that this actually, the earliest citation, and their earliest citation is not always the earliest, it just means it's the earliest one they found so far. Uh, it comes from 1917. Uh, in which an admiral in the British Navy, I think, was writing a letter to Winston Churchill. So it has a certain amount of currency. It wasn't a teenager in a candy shop writing a love note in the, the bathroom. It was, you know, a, a respected, educated member of society writing to another certainly respected, educated member of society, and it was OMG. Um, so uh, I think it's the fact that teenagers are using it is what gets people bent out of shape. And they're using it in what David Crystal usually refers to as a ludic function, meaning just playful. Um, one of the people who tend to study this also point out that um, as smartphones become more and more uh, kind of able, uh, more and more powerful, um, and as people move away from the texting via keyboard shortcuts that, peop that a lot of these words will probably fall by the wayside. Um, a lot of the, the texting conventions that they weren't invented recently but that came into force recently were the result of having nine keys you could press. Um, nine keys for 27 letters and so there were certain things that were very quick and easy. But again, smartphones with predictive text, things like that changing. Um, if, you know, if it memorizes what you've written before, or if you write THR, it assumes you're gonna write through and you just hit a button and it's through. I think that uh, a lot of the texting shorthand will, will disappear. And, but in the meantime, I don't think there's anything really wrong with it. No. Hi. Yeah. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation words that you would sort of discover in your research, you sort of savored by yourself necessarily say. I wonder if you ever get frustrated by that. Like, I, I, I love words. I, I love sialic, that was the word that, uh, about, and, and it's a completely useful word for me because I just had an experience where I want to use it. I, I, I love the sound of it. It's really right. useful. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't like the sound like <laughs> right. <laughs> right. How did, well, my, my, my request was I married a lexicographer. Um, <laughs> so you can get on that. Yeah, uh, my, my wife uh, wrote for Miriam Webster for uh, several years and was the editor there. Um, so uh, I guess we engaged in, uh, you know, and somebody used, asked me, I, I was also a furniture mover for most of my life, and somebody, you know, I used to frequently get the question, well, did you use these words with the furniture movers? I, you know, obviously, I didn't use these words with furniture movers. There's no point in doing that. Um, and I, I, I think that if somebody is intentionally using words that the people to whom you're speaking don't understand, then, then you really are a twit. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I, I try hard not to do that. I, I, in fact, I generally... I generally find I don't like writers who use big words. Um, they, they really kind of annoy me. Um, but I, you know, one notable exception is uh, Nabokov, who I think he, he uses words in such a way that it really makes you want to go find out about the word. He had a, it's one thing that was in the OED where they had, a, I think it was from Pale Fire, and he makes a reference to uh, the train pulls to a stop with a Westinghousean sigh. They had no idea what he was talking about, and then you look it up and it turns out Westinghouse is the man who invented the nomadic brakes. And so he's kind of created a word, and it just is so evocative about the sound that the train makes. And it's, it, you, don't, you don't begrudge him that at all. Um, but I agree that if you just throw a word like sialicman into conversation, it, it's, it's counterproductive. But again, I don't think that you need to use them in order to enjoy these words. Um, I think that they can be perfectly enjoyable and useful for your own sake. Um, and then 
you know, there's the linguistic terminology, which is code switching, meaning you in employ different kinds of speech with different kinds of people. And I think that you can, we all code switch in our daily endeavor. You know, you speak differently to the guy that you buy a bagel from in the morning than you do to your college professor. And I think that you'll eventually come across people with whom you will use certain words and other people with whom you will not. So. Hi. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> my son gets, uh, well, I, I was writing a book about the telephone book when he was born, and so I, I'm sorry to say I read him a lot of telephone book. Uh, does not, he doesn't yet speak, which may have something to do with that. No, um, uh, he seemed to enjoy the telephone book as much as anything else, I have to say. Um, he, was, he was two months old at the time, and I was on deadline. Um, so I, ha I had to read it to somebody, and my wife wouldn't sit still for it. Um, I, I, I read him books that he, uh, he enjoys reading, which is uh, the books of my childhood, um, which are uh, Dalier's Greek myths. Um, uh, we're not on bullfinches yet, but that'll come. Uh, Richard Scarry. Uh, he loves Richard Scarry books. Uh, all kinds of... Uh, Edward Gorey, he's a big fan of Edward Gorey. The Gashley Crum Tinies, which was one of my childhood books. Um, but he, he, uh, he loves reading uh, just letters. He gets very excited about letters. Um, and uh, my son actually, he, he's not, um, he's, according to the, the statistics, he's not speaking as many words as he should be. But the statistics are kind of bloodless things. This has been pointed out many times, and they're really pointless. Um, uh, so I, I haven't really learned anything about language development except that boys pick up words uh, not as fast as girls do and that um, understanding concepts is more important than saying them. Um, so uh, right now my son just loves letters. He loves looking at O and saying O. O. And he walks down the street and he points out O's all the time and E's now and things like that. So. Any other? Oh, I think it's great. I think Lemony Snicket does a beautiful job of that. Um, he's one of the people that does it really well um, because he doesn't come off like... He's being playful with the language, I think. He's not coming off like, uh, like a twit. Uh, and in fact, he, he just wrote a, a great children's book uh, with a, a, an illustrator named Myra Coleman uh, called... I think it's called 13 Words. And it's just a series of words. The first word is this, a uh, bird. And there's a bird sitting on a table. And uh, the second word is despondent. And this is a book for like four and five-year-olds, and he immediately leaps onto despondent. Uh, but he does it in such a, again, a ludic, playful way that I think it really makes kids uh, kind of excited. Uh, I, I read this book to my son as well. Um, so he's working on despondent, though he's not there yet. Um, I, I think it can be fine for, for kids' books. I think it's, it's a, you know, kids also haven't learned yet that they shouldn't know big words. Um, you know, for fear of being beaten in the playground <laughs> with them. Uh, so I think it's a great, great way for, uh, for authors to introduce these words. Yeah. Anybody? No other questions? No other? Nobody wants to start an argument. I'm, I'm, I'm terribly disappointed. But uh, in any event, well then thank you so much for having me. It was really a delight. <laughs> <laughs>